Today, London bears little resemblance to the city once haunted by Jack the Ripper. The gas lights and handsome carriages that dotted the metropolis have long since vanished. A small, unassuming convent is one of the few buildings left from the time of Jack's violent reign. In 1888, London's East End was little more than a mile-square slum. For the ragged masses that called it home, survival was a daily struggle. This was a skid row of the metropolis. A terrible area of, of considerable slums and, and, and poverty. You had the Ashkenazi Jews from Russia and Poland. You had a lot of Irish immigrants who'd come over with the potato famine. And it was a noisy, bustling area. It was a dirty and very, very violent area. Violent crimes were a common occurrence in the East End's Whitechapel and Spitalfields districts. But a brutal series of killings committed between April and early August of 1888 seized attention. Among the victims were 45-year-old Emma Smith, who on April the 3rd was assaulted with a blunt instrument. She died the following day. Three months later, prostitute and street vendor Martha Tabram met a horrible end. On August the 6th, Tabram's last hours were spent soliciting customers with another prostitute, Pearly Poll. They picked up a pair of soldiers, went into different alleys with them, and Pearly Poll never saw Martha again. Her body was found on the staircase of a lodging house the following dawn. She had over 40 stab wounds to the body, Many of them were in the abdominal area, and it is possible that this was the Ripper's first frenzied assault. The man in charge of the investigation was Inspector Edmund Reed, who had served with the Metropolitan Police for 16 years. The five foot six Reed once held the dubious distinction of being the shortest man in the force. Despite his stature, the clever East End detective, Inspector Reed, as one newspaper called him, had moved rapidly up the ranks to his current position as head of Whitechapel's Criminal Investigation Department. Reed had two witnesses in the Tabram case, a police constable and Pearly Poll. The last person she was seen with was a soldier. Identification parades were held in an effort to identify these soldiers. But the identification parades failed and nobody was identified. At Tabram's inquest on August the 9th, the coroner declared her murder one of the most horrible crimes that has been committed in some time past. Despite an atmosphere of fear, prostitutes desperate for money continued to peddle their wares in the back alleys of Whitechapel. Mary Ann Polly Nichols was among them. On the evening of August the 31st, Nichols showed off her new hat to the owner of her boarding house. Owing rent, she drunkenly bragged that with her jolly bonnet, she'd soon have the money. Polly headed out into the night. At around 3.30 a.m. on August 31st, 1888, a carter named George Cross was walking along this East London thoroughfare, then called Bucks Row, when he spied a bundle lying in a gateway that stood here. Crossing to investigate, he saw it was the body of a woman. Within moments, another carter, Robert Paul, had joined him, and they decided to go and find a police officer. They came back with three, one of whom, P.C. Neal, shone his bullseye lantern onto the woman, and the five men saw to their horror that her throat had been cut. And when her body was removed to the mortuary, it was found that not only had her throat been cut almost to the bone, but there was a great mutilating gash down her abdomen. Now, if you like, that gash in itself was a clue to the personality of the killer. This wasn't just somebody robbing her and cutting her throat. There was something sick about the killer himself. 
Wild rumours spread through London. Some citizens wrote to the police, speculating that the murders were being committed by the American actor, Richard Hansfield, who was currently playing the title role in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at a West End theatre. On the morning of Nichols' death, the Star newspaper's headlines read, A revolting murder. Another woman found horribly mutilated in Whitechapel. Ghastly crimes by a maniac. The next day, the Star followed up with even more sensationalised coverage of the murders of Emma Smith, Martha Tabram and Polly Nichols. In each case, the victim has been a woman of abandoned character. Each of the ill-lighted thoroughfares to which the women were decoyed to be foully butchered are off turnings from Whitechapel Road. The fact that these three tragedies are so strangely alike in their details is forcing on all minds the conviction that they are the work of some cool, cunning man with a mania for murder. The alarming similarities of the murders were not lost on the Metropolitan Police, and Scotland Yard was called in to investigate. They assigned one of their most decorated detectives to the case, Inspector Frederick George Aberline. The veteran of 25 years on the force soon found himself pitted against one of history's most nefarious serial killers. Come listen to a dreadful tale I'm telling In Whitechapel three murders have been done With horror many hearts they now are swelling so begins a song that followed the vicious murder of Mary Ann Polly Nichols in August of 1888. The 600,000 men, women and children who called London's poorest quarter home lived in constant fear. A faceless, nameless killer stalked their streets. I think the main thing to remember about the Nichols murder is that the newspapers and the police suddenly thought, have we got a repeat killer on our hands here? And it was immediately associated with the previous murders of Emma Smith and Martha Tabram, which probably weren't related at all, but it was certainly in the press that there, there may be a maniac at large. Alan P. Walter and Son of Spitalfields, a clothing manufacturer, wrote to the Home Office asking them to offer a reward in exchange for information. Much to the public's dismay, the government rejected the request. Rewards had in fact been offered by the Metropolitan Police and others at various times in the past, and the policy had been discontinued because it was felt the offering of rewards encouraged people to give false information in the hope of getting the reward. On the streets of the East End, Inspector Frederick Aberline of Scotland Yard and Inspector Edmund Reed of Whitechapel Division, along with their men, methodically searched for the killer as the press scrutinised their every move. The police were under absolutely outrageous pressure. This was partly nothing to do with them. The first elections to the London County Council were about to happen and the Radical Party had every hope of winning the East End. They realized that a set of sordid murders in this area gave them the opportunity in the newspapers to say, look at the social conditions here. Look why the government is doing nothing. Vote radical. Detectives on the case had little time to worry about political maneuverings. They were in a race to catch their man before he killed again. On September the 5th, the star identified their prime suspect a man known as Leather Apron. A great scare began about somebody called Leather Apron. Leather Apron was supposed to threaten the local prostitutes and extort money from them at knife point, and a number of the prostitutes thought that this man may well have been the Ripper. The real point, of course, is that it was known that Leather Apron was Jewish, and it had nearly started anti-Semitic rioting with the suggestion that a Jew was committing these murders. As tensions grew and the search for Leather Apron intensified, the killer struck again on September the 8th, just before dawn. 
The victim was 47-year-old prostitute Annie Chapman. This was in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street and of course there was severe mutilation. He totally opened the abdominal cavity. Her genitals were on her shoulder. He'd removed the womb and taken it away with him, cut her throat and it was a very unpleasant sight. This time the police had an eyewitness, Mrs Long. Mrs Long, who identified Chapman as a woman she'd seen standing talking to a man at 29 Hanbury Street, described the man as a little taller than the woman, and Chapman was five feet tall. He looked foreign, we don't know why she thought he looked foreign, and she also heard him say to the woman, will you, and she replied yes. And there's a further descriptive um, passage in the local press of the time, which didn't appear in the police reports, that he was wearing a long overcoat and a deerstalker hat. In addition to Mrs Long's testimony, a leather apron was found lying in the backyard at 20 Hanbury Street. Two days later, Sergeant William Thick of the Metropolitan Police arrested boot finisher John Pizer, the man reputed to be leather apron. The police fought through angry mobs as they led Pizer to the station for questioning. Cries of murderer and leather apron filled the air. Now, Paisa had a dodgy record. He had attacked a man with a knife the previous year, and he was charged with indecent assault on a prostitute shortly before the murders began. Under questioning, Paisa denied that he had ever been referred to as leather apron. Sergeant Thick contradicted his testimony, saying he had known him for 18 years and that he was definitely the man known by that name. But Paisa provided a credible alibi and was released. The leather apron found in the yard proved to be a red herring too. It belonged to another local. Adding to Scotland Yard's frustration, several other suspects brought in and interrogated were cleared. The police force came under fire even enduring barbs slung from across the Atlantic. The day after Chapman's murder, the New York Times reported. The Whitechapel fiend murdered his fourth victim this morning and still continues, undetected, unseen, unknown. There's panic in Whitechapel. The London police and detective force is probably the stupidest in the world. And serious historians recognize that, given the limitations of forensic science, which was effectively non-existent at the time, the police really did as good a job as one could reasonably expect. The police put detectives in disguise on the streets, just trying to look the part, wearing patches, walking sticks, anything to make them not look like a detective. But the joke of the time was that whatever they dressed up in, they always kept their big policeman's boots on and gave themselves away. <laughs> The star advocated photographing Annie Chapman's eyes, hoping that the killer's image was seared onto her retina. Only slightly less ludicrous was a prominent politician's suggestion that the murderer was actually a jealous woman. By September of 1888, dozens of additional detectives and policemen had been moved into the East End. They were joined by members of the newly formed Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. Headed by businessman George Lusk, the group made another suggestion that a reward be offered. They were rejected again, a response that set off a new barrage of criticism. There was a, a lot of press antagonism towards the police who were accused at one point of not really making much effort to uh, find out who the Ripper was um, and that they would have made a greater effort if it had taken place in the richer areas of the West End. The police continued to haul in dozens of suspects from the East End. Inspector Aberline considered Joseph Eisenschmidt, a mad Swedish butcher, to be the prime suspect. At the inquest for Annie Chapman, Coroner Wynne Baxter concluded that the killer had surgical expertise, based upon the degree of the mutilations and the fact that Chapman's uterus was missing. The main theories thrown out at the time were that the Ripper might be a butcher or a doctor. This was because some of the medical men examining the bodies thought that he showed some anatomical knowledge. One of them thought he showed actual real skill. 
one should add immediately that others thought he showed no skill whatever. Medical knowledge or not, the killer tried his hand as a writer on September the 27th, in the first of two letters sent to the Central News Agency. Dear boss, I keep hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. The next job I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers just for jolly. Wouldn't you? Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The murderer now had a name. The senior police at the time thought that the letters were the work of a journalist who wanted to keep the story going. Most serious scholars today are quite sure that these letters did not come from the murderer. But what a name he'd created, Jack the Ripper. On September the 24th, 1888, playwright George Bernard Shaw wrote to the star protesting at living conditions in the East End. Will you allow me to make a comment on the success of the Whitechapel murderer in calling attention for a moment to the social question? Whilst we conventional social democrats will waste in our time on education, agitation and organization, some independent genius has taken the matter in hand. The independent genius Shaw speaks of was none other than Jack the Ripper. In a letter to the Central News Agency dated September the 27th, he enthusiastically bragged, My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away. The letter was passed to Scotland Yard, where there was an idea that its author may not be an Englishman. There was the thought that he might be an American. Now this arose because of the famous Jack the Ripper letters, which used phrases which at the time were thought of as Americanisms, notably the opening, Dear Boss. Regardless of his nationality, the Ripper made good on his threat to get to work right away. At 1am on the 30th of September, a carter named Louis Dimschitz pulled his cart into the backyard of the Polish and Jewish Working Men's Club, number 30, Berner Street, on the site now occupied by this school. As he did so, his pony sheared up with alarm and pulled away to the right. Dimschitz climbed down to see what had disturbed the beast and discovered the body of Jack the Ripper's third victim, Elizabeth Stride. She'd only had a throat cut, and the argument for her being a Ripper victim is the killer was disturbed by the arrival of the witness Deem Shoots in his horse and cart, and the killer then made his, his way off without carrying out any further mutilation. I don't think Stride was a Ripper victim, but I can't prove that. Police quickly arrived at the murder scene and launched an intensive search of the area. They believed the killer may still have been lurking nearby. As police canvassed the area, new horrific events were about to unfold less than a mile away in the heart of London. 1.45 a.m. on the morning of the 30th of September, 1888, PC Watkins of the city police turned into Mitre Square. With his bullseye lantern, he began to move around the corners of the square. When the beam illuminated the spot just over here, he saw a bundle, approached it, and stumbled upon the body of Catherine Eddowes, Jack the Ripper's fourth victim. For the first time since the murders began, police found significant clues on Goulston Street back in the East End. One is a piece of apron, and this is important because it was a piece of Catherine Eddowes' apron and he'd used it to wipe his hands on. It was covered with blood and mess from inside her body. The second clue was scrawled in chalk on a nearby wall. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. I think the explanation for the writing on the wall in Goulston Street is it was mere graffiti. I personally think it had nothing to do with the murders. Certainly the apron was Eddowes, but I think the writing was probably already on the wall. In spite of objections from the London City Police, who became involved because of the Eddowes killing in their jurisdiction, Metropolitan Police Commissioner Sir Charles Warren ordered the message erased. Because he believed that anything referring to the Jews, close to a genuine ripper clue, which the apron was, was likely to start up the anti-Semitic rioting, which had threatened, as soon as it was known the police were looking for a Jew. 
several witnesses came forward who had seen both women just prior to their deaths. Israel Schwartz, a Hungarian immigrant, witnessed a man assault Elizabeth Stride just minutes before she was killed. Schwartz went on to describe Stride's attacker as a man of five foot five inches tall with dark hair and clothing, a small brown moustache and a peaked cap. There was also a witness in the Catherine Eddowes case. The man Joseph Lewende saw with Eddowes was a far cry from the dapper image often associated with the Ripper. If you mention that name Jack the Ripper to anybody, it conjures up this image of a man in a top hat carrying a Gladstone bag, stalking the shadows, looking for his unsuspecting prey. That isn't what he would have looked like. If anybody like that had approached the prostitutes at the height of the panic, then they would have screamed out and attracted attention. We know from the descriptions that he wore a peaked cap or hat, that he probably wore a pea jacket and a loosely tied scarf round his neck. If anything, he'd have had something of the appearance of a seaman. We're talking about someone who can commit a murder and then lose himself in streets where you have anything up to 10,000 people walking through those streets. And to have done that, he must have been someone who didn't stand out from the crowd. How was the Ripper able to commit such gory mutilations and escape without being covered in blood? Detective Edmund Reed later described the police's frustration and the killer's modus operandi. The position of the blood in the body showed that he had slashed her throat with his right hand from right to left, causing the blood to spurt away from him, so that he probably never had any blood stains on his clothes. One of the great difficulties of the case for the police was that it was a case of a maniac's cunning, outwitting reason's methods. On the morning after the double murder, the Central News Agency received another taunting postcard from Jack the Ripper. It was written in red ink and matched the handwriting of the previous correspondence. It is believed that the letter was written on September the 30th, the date of the killings. I was not codding, dear old boss, when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about Saucy Jackie's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a bit, couldn't finish you straight off. Had not time to get ears for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. On the same day that the letter arrived at the Central News Agency, the Lord Mayor of London offered a £500 reward for information leading to the conviction of Catherine Eddowes' killer. He received nearly 1,400 tip-offs. Fear of the Ripper led many prostitutes to abandon their nocturnal pursuits. Scotland Yard increased the number of men on the beat from 27 to 89. No two policemen were further than 15 minutes from each other as they walked the streets. Copies of the two Ripper letters were published and posted throughout the East End in the hope that someone would recognise the handwriting. On October the 16th, George Lusk, head of the Citizens' Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, received a mysterious parcel in the post. It was a small cardboard box containing half a human kidney longitudinally divided and uh, a letter from hell stating it was half the kidney he had taken from one of the women which he had preserved. It wasn't signed with any name, it just said catch me when you can. The one letter that some experts today think might be genuine is the Lusk letter. But the kidney is really another of the slightly grey areas. For a long time, we all thought it was a hoax. But more recently, Nick Warren, the editor of Ripperana, who is himself a surgeon, has looked closely at the medical report on Catherine Eddowes, and there are medical reasons for thinking that this kidney could have come from Catherine Eddowes. Even as Lusk received the macabre package, Scotland Yard and City Police brought in more than 80 suspects for questioning and followed up on hundreds of leads. As weeks passed, public fear abated and many of the East End's 1,200 or more prostitutes returned to their work. This development played right into the hands of the killer, a fact lamented by Chief Inspector Henry Moore, a colleague of Abilene's. 
What makes it so easy for him is that the women lead him of their own free will to the spot where they know interruption is least likely. It's not as if he had to wait for his chance. They make the chance for him. Mary Jane Kelly was not one of those women, although she worked as a prostitute in the East End. The attractive 25-year-old saw her clients in her boarding room at Miller's Court. Her rent was well overdue, so she continued working, despite knowing a killer was on the loose. In the early morning hours of November the 9th, a man carrying a parcel, and who was later described as foreign-looking, with a carroty moustache, entered Mary Jane Kelly's room. A couple of hours later, neighbours reported hearing a cry of murder, but no one investigated further. At 10 o'clock in the morning on the 9th of November, 1888, a rent collector turned into Dorset Street, now obliterated by these modern developments. He turned into Miller's Court and knocked on the door of the ground floor room. He got no reply. He pulled aside a curtain that covered a broken window pane and discovered the body of Mary Kelly, Jack the Ripper's final victim. At least five women had died at the hands of the Ripper. A distraught Queen Victoria telegraphed the Prime Minister urging some very decided action. England's cabinet authorised a pardon to anyone who came forward as an accomplice of Kelly's killer. Meanwhile, Scotland Yard increased its numbers on the street, from 89 to 143 men. But it proved to be a case of too little, too late. The killings mysteriously ceased. There can be no doubt that the murders stopped either because the murderer died or he was arrested, incarcerated or prevented from moving by some other cause or just possibly because he moved somewhere else and his renewed murders were never noted. There is no other reason why this type of murderer stops. Eventually, the Metropolitan Police reduced their presence, as the havoc wreaked by the Ripper dissipated and life in the East End returned to normal. It's a common fallacy that the murders ceased after November 1888 because, of course, we have the murder of Alice Mackenzie on the 17th of July. 1889, and the final Whitechapel murders victim was Francis Coles on the 13th of February, 1891. Could it be that Jack the Ripper had returned after a seven-month respite? The theory was taken up by Inspector Edmund Reed of the Metropolitan Police. Inspector Reed seemed to think that um, Mackenzie and Coles were in fact also Ripper victims. Despite Reed's beliefs, the killings, while violent, lacked the frenzied characteristics of the earlier crimes. Some suggested they were the work of a copycat killer. It's unlikely, I would think, that any of those uh, subsequent crimes were the work of the Ripper. The police were divided as to just how many women the Ripper had actually killed. A debate that continues among Ripper historians. I don't think there's anything unusual in there being uncertainty about the number of victims we can ascribe to any one serial killer. My own belief is that Jack the Ripper killed between four and six women. If I had to put my hand on my heart and say how many were killed by one hand, you could really only name three if you're looking at modus operandi, and the three would be Nichols, Chapman and Eddowes. But even more controversial is the identity of the man himself. In 1894, a memorandum written by Sir Melville McNaughton Assistant Chief Constable of Scotland Yard's Criminal Investigation Department appeared in the Sun newspaper. He penned a document naming three people he thought were likely suspects, Druitt, Ostrog and Kosminski. This 1894 mention is the first mention we find of those names in connection with the murders. Druitt was a school teacher and barrister. He committed suicide at the end of 1888, shortly after the murder of Mary Kelly. Apparently feared that he was going insane. We have absolutely no knowledge or idea of why he ever became a candidate for being the Ripper, other than the fact that McNaughton says the family 
thought that he, he was possibly the murderer. The second suspect was Aaron Kosminski, a Polish-Jewish hairdresser who was declared legally insane in 1888. Sir Robert Anderson, head of Scotland Yard CID, claimed that a witness identified this man as the murderer. In the end, claims that he had a hatred of women and strong homicidal tendencies proved unfounded, and Kosminski was ruled out as a suspect by most ripperologists. McNaughton's third and final suspect was Michael Ostrock, a Russian con man who had passed himself off as everything from a surgeon to a priest. Ostrog, I think we can fairly safely dismiss. He was uh, a much older man. He was a con man and a petty thief and was probably in France at the time of, of the murders. McNaughton and Anderson were but two of the scores of men with a vested interest in the Whitechapel murders. In 1903, the now retired detective Frederick Aberline suspected George Chapman a man who was convicted of poisoning his three wives. Abilene believed that if you were wicked enough to poison your wives, you were clearly wicked enough to be Jack the Ripper. Well, wicked enough maybe, but psychologically, they're totally different types of crime, and Chapman clearly was not Jack the Ripper. Abilene later conceded that Scotland Yard was really no wiser on the subject than it had been 15 years ago. When an American journalist visited the Yard's Crime Museum in the early 1900s, he asked why there were no relics of the Ripper murders. The detective conducting the tour replied, There is no more of a clue to that chap's identity than there is to the identity of some murderer who will kill someone a hundred years from now. Public Enemy Number 1 continues in a few minutes. You can read more about the infamous characters featured in this series on our website. Although more than a hundred years have passed since Jack the Ripper took his last victim, the case remains attractive to crime sleuths, amateur and professional alike. Year after year, books come out and the theories come out, and each year you'll think, we've caught him, that's definitely him, that's convinced me, and then you'll read the next book and think, oh, that could be him as well. The hunt for Jack the Ripper is no longer carried out on the streets of the East End. Instead, men and women seeking the Ripper's true identity spend hours sifting through documents in libraries and archives around the world. In 1992, a journal surfaced that was purported to be that of Jack the Ripper. The author, supposedly James Maybrick, a Liverpool cotton broker who died in 1889, Numerous experts were called in to ascertain the document's authenticity. There's no information in the Maybrick diary which is, is in any way significant. Uh, or it, there's nothing there which tells us anything or provides us with any additional information, which is one of the reasons why so many people initially considered it was a forgery anyway. Year after year, the public is deluged with some rather sensational Jack the Ripper theories ranging from speculation that the Ripper was Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert, to a suggestion that the crimes were the work of the secretive order of Freemasons. In 1993, Ripper historian Stuart Evans made a stunning discovery. An 80-year-old letter written by Chief Inspector John George Littlechild, head of Special Branch, Scotland Yard. I found the Littlechild letter naming a brand new suspect that uh, nobody had ever heard of before. And that was Dr. Tumblety, the quack American doctor. Though court records from the time indicate that Tumblety was arrested on November the 7th for gross indecency with a male, it's possible that he was released in time to have murdered Mary Jane Kelly two days later on the 9th. A week and a half later, Tumblety jumped bail and fled to America. Scotland Yard officers pursued him to New York, so they obviously felt there was something a bit more serious than the misdemeanour of gross indecency. Tumblety eluded his pursuers and was never captured. Though much of his private life is cloaked in mystery, the not-so-good doctor remains a prime suspect. I think if I had to give my own opinion on what the Ripper looked like, 
I would paint a picture of a person similar to Tumblety who was a great misogynist, he hated prostitutes. He got an anatomical collection, if the stories are to be believed in the States, of, of wombs in glass jars. He's got all the prerequisites and I think Tumblety is the right sort of man. As with nearly every other facet of the Ripper murders, there is controversy about Tumblety's viability as a suspect, largely because of his alleged homosexuality. Now, homosexual serial killers kill other men. They don't kill women. In the case of the Ripper, we are definitely looking for a heterosexual, not for someone like Dr. Tumblety. If not Tumblety, who are the prime suspects? I believe that Jack the Ripper was probably a man who was put into the asylum under the name of David Cohen by the police. Now he goes in at precisely the right time for the murders to stop. He is a poor foreign immigrant Jew from Whitechapel and he is the most violent man to appear in Coney Hatch workhouse records over the next two years. My own personal opinion is that it was someone who, as many of the police officers who worked on the case say, was just an ordinary Polish Jewish immigrant living in the heart of the neighborhood. The true identity of Jack the Ripper is something that we may never really know, but it's very difficult to say that with any certainty because so much has happened over the last few years. In 1988, John Douglas, a former agent and profiler from the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit, attempted to reconstruct Jack the Ripper's personality. Douglas believed that the Ripper mutilated animals as a child, worked as a butcher or mortuary attendant, was plagued by paranoia and probably carried a knife for protection. Douglas also thinks that the Ripper lived or worked very near the location of his first murder and harboured a great hatred for women and prostitutes. Psychologically speaking, we're talking about someone who was very much in control of his emotions to begin with, but then this bloodlust, this need to murder. Uh, Motive-wise, there's no motive. He does it for the satisfaction of the murders. Given the advances in criminology and psychological profiling, coupled with the research of historians, we may one day learn Jack the Ripper's true identity. But until then, his gruesome legend will continue to endure. You've got Victorian gaslit streets, Victorian fogs, handsome cabs. It's the whole romance of the period, the magic name Jack the Ripper. I think everybody likes a whodunit, and Jack the Ripper is the classic whodunit. Coming up in a moment on the History Channel, personal moments from the past recalled in a small piece of history.